it is that he said. And every once in a while, I would feed back a statement to John that he said, and he'd get this look on his face that was an aha. And as soon as he got that aha, his whole perspective on whatever he was struggling with changed. Well, I started out by saying I must be confident, self-assured, and worthy. And we went through the routine that I wasn't good enough. Um, I won't be respected, uh, won't be liked, won't have a relationship, I'll be lonely, insecure. And uh, then it started to c become a round robin in that uh, situation where one thing sort of fed on another. And we're trying to grasp where the roots of all that was. And um, recent events in my life uh, have made me have some doubts about myself and wonder, you know, where I had messed up, where I had screwed up, as I put it. And uh, and, and in dealing with that and uh, knowing that I had made some mistakes. And I think when Stephen asked me, you know, well, something about mistakes, I don't remember the exact statement, but all of a sudden, you know, an image of my father popped in my mind uh, back when I was a boy where mistakes were not tolerated. And uh, so immediately I says, well, I cannot tolerate mistakes in myself. And uh, so that's where the real issue was, is that, that I had made a mistake and that was simply not acceptable. And uh, I need to accept the fact that, you know, people do make mistakes, I make mistakes, and still uh, uh, be confident and, and assured, uh, or self-assured, knowing that it's okay to make mistakes and to learn from them and uh, go on. Congratulations. In talking with John about that, you know, he was basically telling us that at first this belief that if I make a mistake, then I can't be confident. If I make a mistake, I can't be worthy. But as he talked about it, the more he talked, all he had to do was keep on talking, he got a different perspective of what mistakes are and how he relates to them, how he can relate to them. The more you let out some of those beliefs that you hold down in there, you know, these, all these beliefs are fighting with one another. If you operate from the perspective of, I, he's trying to deal with his mistakes. You know, he may have done some things that were mistakes. Um, operating from the perspective of, I have to be confident and worthy. And what was the other thing? Self-assured. Self it's an attempt to keep him from making the same old mistakes. All he needed to do was keep on talking to himself until he got a different perspective of the same issue. And that different perspective said, I can learn from my mistakes. I can make mistakes and still be confident and self-assured and worthy. He just got a new way to look at himself and overcome the very problem that was being created by his way of thinking. Yes, Barbara. Stephen, isn't this a learning planet? And if, we, and if we were perfect, we wouldn't be here to begin with. So that's why we make mistakes. If we can look at it that way, then we can learn from them. Absolutely. And we all can say that. But we're, when, when each of us are in the middle of this thing that, you know, I've got to do it right, I've got to do it right, somehow we don't tend to see through that. <laughs> Jeanette just realized she's sitting up here in front of the camera. <laughs> Where's Patrick? Patrick recently said something to me that I didn't really get at the time. But I got it now, and that is that I'm terribly afraid of people finding out who I really am. <laughs> and uh, g getting down past all of the other things, the bottom line is sometimes, well, my statement is I have to be spiritual, unconditionally loving, and okay with being myself alone. And the bottom line of all of that was feeling needy, that it's not okay to feel needy in any way, that you cannot feel like you need, or me, I cannot feel like I need anything. If I need anything, then I'm not OK. So coming through, realizing that that's what I was afraid of people finding out, that I'm really very needy sometimes. So.
you may have noticed that by starting to do this, you bring up some emotions. Okay. Those, that's you trying to communicate with yourself about something that's important. What we're suggesting is that you listen to them. And again, I'm, I'm re-emphasizing, I'm saying some of the same thing over and over again until maybe it really gets drilled in there. You don't need to be given an answer. You only need to listen to yourself. When you listen to yourself, you will change your perspective about what you believe. You'll change your perspective about the very thing that you're struggling with, and that change in perspective can relieve the struggle and help you make your next step. It's as simple as that. It's one of those simple truths that we think that we've got to complicate because our problem is so deep and so heavy. It's a simple truth that will always get you where you need to go. And the only thing that, if you think that there's another person who has a lot of wisdom who could help you through it, the first thing that they'll need to do is listen to you to understand where you're coming from. Because if they can't start with you from where you're at, they're not going to be able to get you anywhere else. If you don't start where you're at, you won't be able to go somewhere else. And that's all you're, all you're doing, is you're finding out where you are, taking a new perspective on that. We're practicing, and we're going to be doing this uh, a little bit later today and also some more tomorrow, with the meditation of practicing being like this inner self-helper that doesn't make the judgments, doesn't make decisions about whether you're worthy or not. It just accepts and observes. Let's you live with all your own judgments if you want them. You can do that. That was it. I mentioned in one of the other classes, I had this meditation where I went up to my fourth terrace in the meditation. And uh, I wanted to be forgiven of all the judgments that I had that, that were re bought bad and wrong and all that. And my inner teacher just sat back like this and said, it's all right with me. They're your judgments. If I can treat myself the same way, accept the judgments, accept the beliefs, accept the thinking processes that I go through, and just observe them, just watch them, I will learn all that I need to learn from them. So we keep on working with this process until it takes us to the simple truth. And I think what we need to do now, because we're getting real far along here. Grace has got some things that she's going to share with us. We're going to take a break for 15 minutes. Be sure, please, be back in your seats at 10 after 5 so that we have enough time to do the whole next process. Night and yesterday, you're getting a handle on your self-talk. OK? There's a lot of phrases. I want to come after self-talk today from a, a number of different angles, if you will. I even want to get a little esoteric with it, if you will. And we can call it self-talk. And we can also call it the inner dialogue. And as some of you have heard me relate to this concept in prior workshops, I've discussed it from the, the angle of being conscious versus unconscious. And I will give you a fairly bold statement. If you don't know your self-talk, then you can't in any given moment prove if you're conscious or unconscious. Are you with me? When our self-talk becomes habitual and we start running our life according to our self-talk, that's what I refer to as being unconscious in any given moment. My response to the situation is automatic based on my self-talk, based on what I am saying to myself and which part of myself is saying it. And the question always comes up every time we do this workshop, how can you figure out what your self-talk is? The answer to the question is you can discover as much of your self-talk as you are willing to be aware of. Are you with me on that? You can discover as much of it as you are willing to be aware of. And we're going to look at it, as I said, from a number of different angles today. If it gets confusing, let me know. We'll back up and take another approach. We're going to talk about it a lot today from a perspective of triangulation. And there's one principle about self-talk that I want to get really, really clear, because I know that some people in here have already made this mistake, quote unquote, 
And I know that because I've done enough self-talk workshops and it's fairly common. And that is we get into the space of I have this lovely little child who wants to do all these things in this cruel parent. How many people have already started to lean in that direction? I love my little child and I've got to deal with my parent, my critical parent. There's one thing you want to know about the parent part of self. If it wasn't for the parent part of self, you wouldn't be here. Okay? So it is not a matter of which child or the child or the parent. It's not a matter of which one is most important. It is not a matter of which one should get the most, of te uh, most attention. And another thing I want to s tell you is yesterday you were probably asked to give the child a name and to give the parent a name. No? Oh, okay. When if I say stuff that I think was covered and it wasn't, let me know. We want to give the child a name. And we want to give the parent a name. One of them would probably be the name you use every day. And the other one would probably be your middle name. And if you don't have a middle name, make one up. Now don't ask me which one should be, which, which name do I give the child and which name do I give the parent. Think about it for a moment. Name your child and name your parent. Okay? Can everybody see the flip chart? Give the child and a parent a name so when you talk with them, there is a name involved. All right? For example, I call my child Gary and I call my parent Thomas. All right? Paul Solomon calls the child Ben and the parent Paul. Okay? So give a name to the child and give a name to the parent. And don't get caught in the trap of trying to figure out when you're listening to the conversation which one is which. Because your child is capable of disguising itself as your parent, and your parent is capable of disguising itself as the child. Are you with me? The child and the parent will play a lot of games with you, the real you. And it is not important when you're listening to your self-talk that you say, oh, there's a self-talk statement and that's my child. You can do that if you want. It's not important. What is important is to get the statement. Because it is your self-talk that controls your life more than probably any other factor. Your self-talk is controlling your life. And the dangerous part about our self-talk is we believe it. Is everybody with me on that? We believe our self-talk. We believe our self-talk even if 15 or 20 people come to us and say that isn't true. We will still believe our self-talk until we ourselves decide to change it. There is not a person on the planet who can make you change your self-talk or convince you it's not true until you make that decision to change the self-talk. So don't worry about which one is which, OK? In the diagram we're using here, this is love, truth, and heaven. This is hell and death. The line across here is the plane of earth. And we live on that plane with a child and a parent. Now there's an interesting thing that happens. And maybe it's too bad it works this way, but it does work this way. The child and the parent cannot have a direct conversation. Is everybody with me on that? The way the universe is structured, the parent cannot say to the child, blah, 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 blah. And the child says back, blah, 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 blah. And I'll explain why as we go on. I can't tell you why right now without jumping through the lecture. Just trust me for this moment that they don't talk directly. The message either goes this way or the message goes this way. Need I tell you which one most human beings use most? <laughs> you with me? What is down here is judgment, blame, you should, you shouldn't, how could you, 
constricting, re, you know, you following me? The fear side of the spectrum. Up here is the love, the supportive side of the spectrum. And the conversation is, all conversations are going one way or the other. You can scream as loud as you want to scream, and it isn't going to go this way. It's going to follow one of these two paths, all right? Most of us think that it is the critical parent that has shut, shut down the child. And for a lot of us, that's valid, but it's not an either or. Also be aware, if some of you will, that some of us have a little child that is an absolute spoiled brat. And no matter how hard the parent tries to help that child, the child refuses to respond. And if you have children, you know what I'm talking about. Because the child wants to claim his or her identity, okay? And the parent wants to claim his or her identity. And if you don't have to give a lot of thought to remember when your parent was trying to claim identity, okay? Driving a car, smoking cigarettes, sexuality. There's a lot of areas you can find in your life habits you picked up on. You know, when I started looking at quitting smoking, I ran into an interesting thing. I, I looked back and I looked back and tried to find when I started smoking and discovered that it was a parent thing. It was my parent who got into cigarettes because I felt grown up. And I discovered something interesting. Every time I tried to quit cigarettes, I felt like a little child who hasn't grown up yet. Are you with me? That's how connected it gets. So all of our habits and all of our beliefs, and again, for most of us, not as a judgment, it's going on down here. It's not all that supportive all the time. There's habits attached to it. But the master said, know thyself and resist not. And part of what he was teaching when he gave us that one-liner was, you better find out what your self-talk is because it's controlling your entire life. It controls everything you can do. And it's a conversation that a person rarely stops. You may, at times, be able to stop your self-talk in meditation. All right? Possibly. And some of us can't even do that. Are you with me? Have you ever had that experience of going into meditation and trying to be really spiritual and really devoted and really into it, and all of a sudden here comes one of those thoughts and you're thinking, oh my God. What am I doing thinking this kind of stuff when I'm in the middle of a meditation? You know? Or have you ever been in church? There, you know, it's interesting, these workshops we're doing. Um, how many of you people in here watch Star Wars? Or Star Trek, I'm sorry, Star Trek. Are you aware that right now Star Trek is coming very close to following our weekend workshops? Have you been noticing that? Well, I, I turned the TV on this morning while I was just looking at the paper quick and drinking my coffee and trying to wake up. And, and I, 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 mean, I don't have his name, and I apologize. I got this black minister. How many people have ever seen this black minister that's on on Sunday morning? He's got a congregation of about three or 4,000 people, magnificent church, and he was talking about what to do with self-talk this morning. And he was describing how... He tries to control his self-talk, you know, and he's on his knees, he's in church, and he's praying, and all of a sudden, he catches one of the choir girls and starts, the mind starts, you know, and what do you do with it? And the guy was great with it, and the best part I liked about it was when he talked about resist not, and this is what the master told us. If you start fighting with your self-talk, I can tell you who's going to win. I can save you the battle. You can't outthink the part of you that thinks. Don't try. It's designed to think. That's what these parts of you do, and they will outthink you every time. So what we want to do is change the direction of our self-talk. Rather than trying to stop having negative self-talk statements, I want to change the direction. So if the parent in me wants to talk to the child in me, what I want to do is pause for a moment and send the communication 
through love and back down to the child rather than through hell. Okay? We're going to change the direction of our self-talk. So our self-talk is always loving and supportive of the child. Or if the child wants to talk to the parent, we want to do the same thing. We want to change the direction. And part of what I'm giving you now is, I'm going to go over it later, we're going to give you 40 days in the wilderness with your self-talk. And every, every day, two or three times a day, we're going to do a little meditation, directing our self-talk through living love and back down to the child or to the parent. But I also want to tie into this, tie this in for you esoterically, if you will, to one of the greatest masters that's ever walked the planet. And that was the Christ or living love. And the Christ or living love did an awful lot on self-talk. And a lot of us may not be aware of that. You may find, now I find this information absolutely fascinating. And some of the rest of you may find it fascinating, you may not. You may want to know that the, that the child and the parent are the two thieves crucified on Mount Calvary with the Christ. When I discovered that, I was really, I've always wondered all through the Catholic religion, all through life, why would there have been two other people crucified on Mount Calvary with the Christ? And if they were there, who were they? How did they relate esoterically? It's the child and it's the parent that are crucified with the Christ on Mount Calvary. Because no matter how much you love this child, there's something you need to know about the child. The child will do everything, bar nothing, in its power to convince you that it is the real you. Are you with me? And while the child is doing everything in its power to say to you, I am the real you, listen to me, the parent is doing everything in its power to say to you, I am the real you, listen to me the two thieves who tried to steal the birthright. So one thing you may be interested in knowing is the real you is not the child, and the real you is not the parent. They are parts of you that are going on in your life. Not to get us confused, there are also a lot more parts of us in there. Have you ever noticed that? There's not just a child and a parent. There is also inside of you, the you that you are afraid you are. There is also inside of you, the you that you want us to believe you are. Now, how do I find out, working with all of this, how do I discover who is the me that I'm afraid I am? I want to show you how briefly, and you can do a lot more of this later, but take your pencils and papers right now and write down on a piece of paper, wh whatever comes to you, that which you would absolutely, totally be horrified if you were that way. The more you get into it, the more it's going to work for you. You can if you want. <laughs> yes, you have to put your name and pass these in when you're done. <laughs> At least list three or four. What are three or four things that if it was a part of you, you would be horrified to discover it? <laughs> right. What are some things that I would be horrified to discover that I'm that way? Oh, I know a joke about that, but I better not do it for the whole group. <laughs> you want to share that one? <laughs> Yeah. 
if you really want the self-talk workshop to work, list out all of the things that would horrify you if you were that way and discover and admit that you are. Now, I'm very serious about that. I'll give you an example along these lines that we, <laughs> I'm going to change one. I was doing a workshop in Holland one time, and we had a lady in the workshop, and she wrote down things like beating other people, being cruel to other people, being vicious with other people. And then she raised her hand when I said, you are your list, and she said, there's no way. And just trust me when I tell you, if you would have been in this program and known this lady, you would also know that that's how she treated herself. She was so hard on herself, it was unbelievable. It was cruel looking, the way she would beat herself, okay? And tear herself down to herself and to others. So the only way I can have a me that I'm afraid I am is to already have discovered that part of myself. And that's what starts to make up the me that I want you to believe I am. If you're not following me, ask me. Yes? You mean negative part of us is what, what our minds want us to not be. Let me, let me reword the whole thing a whole other way. There's one thing that all of us in here can know about each other, and we can use it against each other, or we can just know it. Everybody in this room has done some pretty selfish, rotten things intentionally. Anybody want to raise their hand and say that isn't true? Seriously. We all know that about each other. We know it about ourselves if we're willing to get honest with ourselves. Yes, there are and there have been those moments when I intentionally did that, wanting to hurt that person, wanting it to work. And if it didn't work, I tried it again. Are you with me? Or, a different way. or a di <laughs> thank you. Or a different way, OK? Do, do realize now, we're not talking about right or wrong in this workshop. We're talking about the things we experience and what leads us up to wherever we are in our life right now. Each one of us has done some pretty rotten things. And sometimes we even compete to see who can be the rottenest. <laughs> we do. You can especially watch it when we're having a seminary program like we are right now, and all you in the seminary program, excuse me for saying this. However, when you put a p group of people together for four months and someone throws a dart, you only have to wait a little while to watch who will escalate next and throw a dart with, with a nuclear warhead on it. And you wait a little while longer and someone throws one with chemical gases because we start to learn which darts are going to work best in the workshop, OK? So we know that we do that. And the truth sets us free. If I can admit that I do that, then I can stop doing it. If I don't admit that I do it, then it's going to be impossible to stop. However, having said that, on the other side of the coin, I have also watched this seminary group do some very loving things that they didn't have to do with each other. There was no one standing there saying, you need to do that. So inside of us is the me that I'm afraid I am and the me that I want you to believe I am. So now what I have described to you is a child and a parent Sometimes the child is very loving. Sometimes the child is an absolute brat, period. Sometimes the parent is very loving, and sometimes the parent is locked in, bullheaded, uncooperative, and will not give in. There is also, and I won't point it out in the chart, you decide, there's also in there a me that I'm afraid I am and a me that I want you to believe I am. Now, that's four conversations that go on in our head, OK? The most important thing to know about what we've looked at so far is neither one of those four are you. The real you. They're parts of you. They're creations of you. However, they're not you. Okay? 
The two thieves on the cross are not you. But they have and they will be. And they'll even try after this workshop this afternoon to convince you that some of the things I said are not right because I am the child and I'm the real you. And the parent's going to come back around within 72 hours and do a little scenario to say, no, the child isn't the real you. I'm the real you. This is part of the scenario of the whole struggle of life. Where is the real me? And who are these other parts of me trying to claim my birthright? OK? The real you is most likely hanging on a cross. Are you with me? If the story of the master hanging on a cross related to a person 2,000 years ago, then the story has no value for us today. And if we don't discover what the master was trying to show us, then the crucifixion becomes a tragedy. Are you with me? I know I'm using some harsh terms, but are you with me on this? It is most likely, for the average human being, I'm including myself, so I'm talking with you, the average human being crucifies living love daily. And lets either the child or the parent reign and run free. Do you understand my point? Is everybody with me? This is not a judgment. This is not an accusation. It's information for clarity. Yes. Pardon me? Well, we can go back to some of the other workshops, OK? Every relationship, every experience we have is an opportunity to express our true nature, OK? Now, assuming you all agree, at least for this workshop, that our true identity is love, love and life and light, all OK? Every time I do not express my true identity, I crucify it. And I allow something else to express. You know, I opened a, a Sunday service one time. And uh, one of the only times Paul has ever corrected me in what I say in a lecture. And let me see if I can remember exactly how I did this. The opening, you know, when you do a Sunday service and you've only got 30 minutes to get the group's attention, usually your, your first statement has to be a one-liner that grabs the group's attention. So, and I wanted to talk about the crucifying of the Christ, so I opened the, one, I opened the Sunday service by saying, you have either crucified the Christ today or you've taken the Christ off the cross. Which one is it? You with me? And after the Sunday service, Paul said, Thomas, that's a true statement. It is the truth. It's something we do daily. And don't lay that trip on people. Find another way to word it. Find another way to say it. All right? The principle is either I am allowing love to express through me or I am crucifying love. And that's the question we can ask ourselves. Okay, while these two thieves are trying to steal our birthright and claim that I'm the real you. The thing we want to do, as Ron did for us in the meditation, is at the end of 40 days, and I'll give you the exercise before we're done today, but and Ron did it for you in the meditation, at the end of 40 days, there is not a child and a parent in a, in a, in a Christ or a love, and there's, it all becomes one. It all aligns itself into oneness, OK? It aligns itself into oneness. So it is not a game of duality. This triangle we have is the trinity that's in all religions, the one, the two, the three. Three brings us back to one. It doesn't go on to four. Now, I know a lot of school teachers would argue that point. However, in sacred numbers, one, two, three, the one. You don't start counting with numbers until you use the principle four. All right? So the three becomes the one. And that's what we want to do with our self-talk in triangulation. We want to bring this into harmony. So the battle stops. And it is love that speaks to us, speaks through us, speaks to the child, speaks to the parent, until we get to the point that love is 
what is speaking. Or another word that possibly works better is the observer. How many of you have met the part of you that is the observer? You know, while all this activity is going on, there is this part of us that stands back behind and just kind of watches the whole thing. Just stands there and watches and is very loving and will not give input if not asked. And here's something else you may want to know. If the child asks love for input on how to control your life, and the parent disagrees, love will not respond. Now don't misunderstand this. Hold that until we do the whole lecture. This part of us that is the observer, the part of us that is living love, will respond when all of me comes together and turns my life over to the observer, or to living love, or to the Christ, or to, depending on what religion, over to Jesus, whatever you want to call it. Did you get the story? this weekend, Paul may have shared it with, with us already, the lady who does a lot of work in psychology and working with people with multi-personalities, did, did they tell you that yesterday? Okay. Is anybody here who doesn't know the multi-personality story? Okay, let me share it just because you, you're going to enjoy this and it supports this. I forget her name. If anybody can think of it, remind me. She worked with multi-personalities, and she was working with this one person who had five or six personalities, distinctly different personalities, so distinctly different that one of the personalities had diabetes and the other ones didn't. Now get this. When the personality with diabetes was the dominant expressing personality, that vehicle had diabetes. When it wasn't, the vehicle did not have diabetes. This is a true story. It's documented. And if, and if anybody wants to work with this, let me know. I'll find the author and the name of the book where this information is. Yes. Dolores Krieger, yes. I believe you're right. OK, she's written some papers and some books on this. The, that in itself is very fascinating. So there is a part of you that can believe and be attuned to certain illnesses. And when that part of you is not expressing, the illness will go into remission. When that part of you starts expressing again, the illness starts to manifest it again. But what this lady found that was really incredible is she found another personality, being a psychologist, that's what she called it, who, call, who said, I am the inner self-helper. And she started talking to this personality and asking this personality, are you, can you help this person bring all these parts of self together? And the personality said, yes. And she asked the personality, do you know what the problems are? And this part of self said, yes. And then she said, will you heal all these parts of the self? And, the part, and this part responded, not without the permission of all the other six parts, all the other six personalities. What this lady discovered was, the, you can call it the inner self helper, you can call it living love, you can call it Christ, you can call it the real you. But she discovered some fascinating things about it. It would not manipulate the other personalities. It would not force the other personalities to do any particular thing and never judge them. When asked what this part of self thought about the other parts of self, this part was very supportive. As a matter of fact, what she discovered that really impressed her was always supportive. Always. So that's a key in wanting to know if the voice I am listening to is love or is it another part of myself. And here's the key. Love will never use fear as a part of the communication. Are you with me? Have you ever caught yourself as a parent justifying using just a little bit of fear to get the child's attention? Have you ever caught yourself doing it? I've caught myself doing it. Totally justifying, well, it's OK to use a little bit. You know? Love will never use fear in the communication. Love will always respond to you with a supportive, loving response. And you can always take the answer within and sense that that was the answer I'm looking for. Ron. Is it? Great. 
14. Thank you. Now, what happens as these two argue with each other, what we begin to build is a veil. And the, a veil is the, is the word you want to use. We begin to build a veil because we, the real us begins to, to believe in vulnerability. OK? Do you, can you remember? And I'm sure each one of us can either remember, has dealt with it, or still needs to deal with your first traumatic experience. Are you with me? If you can go back far enough, maybe it was even the birth experience, the first traumatic experience, and we start to build this veil that we start to stretch between the two polarities. OK? However, this graph doesn't give you the clear picture because we really stretch the veil between these two polarities. OK? So we build a veil in between here. And the veil looks something like this. It's interesting how it happens. We stretch it across here. And on the side of the veil that you're looking at right now, Thomas is showing you a veil that says, this is the Thomas I want you to believe I am. And I'm sitting here looking at all of your veils, looking at the you that you want me to believe you are. Are you, are you with me? By we use our personality, we use our character, we use our education, we use our looks, we use clothes, we use makeup, we use cars, we use houses, we use careers. All of those things are a part of this veil that is now stretched between heaven and hell and the child and the parent. This is why you can't talk directly to the child and the parent. There's a veil between there. And it's stretched tight. And it is very difficult to get a person to open that veil. The sad part of the veil is the side of the veil, again, that you're seeing right now, right this minute, I don't deny it. I wouldn't be standing here without it, most likely, is a veil that says, this is the Thomas I want you to believe he is. Isn't he good lecturer? Doesn't he know his information? His, I hope he's dressed appropriately today. Hope his hair looks all right. Are you with me? I hope you can smell my perfume and not my lack of it. I, I'm serious about this. You got me? That's what I want you to see. You know what I see from my side of the veil? The me that I'm afraid I am. Has anybody not had the experience? From my side, of the veil, there is this me that I'm afraid I am. And I'm thinking, God, I sure hope they don't find out that I don't know this material. I'm winging this stuff up here, you know? Or I hope they don't find out that I can feel the sweat dripping down my back. And that means I'm going to be smelling here in just a few minutes. So I'll leave quick. Are you with me? Behind the veil is a you. And for a lot of us, that you is dead. Are you with me? It's on a cross. It died. It was crucified for fear of whatever. For fear of whatever. So we put on all these nice clothes, and we spray cologne or perfume, and we do all of these things. And if you sit eye to eye and look at me long enough, I'm going to look away because I don't want you to know that I got a dead body in here. And if I try to look into your eyes long enough, you're going to look away because you don't want me to know that you've got a dead body in there. So if we put on enough perfume, we don't smell dead. <laughs> Are you staying with me? I, I, could, I didn't hear all that. I did a long way nothing, and that was it that I did. Just a minute. Get a mic. I still didn't hear that clear enough to answer. It's on. It's on. Okay, try it again. 
Um, okay. After years that I was completely destructive to myself and completely dead, okay. I didn't take any part from of, of nice clothes of all the things. When I changed that and get in touch with my life, then I start to take also parfum. So when I now put on parfum, mm. then is that an expression mm. for me of my life impulse and not of mm. that. Mm. So how do we see that? Okay. I'm, I, if I'm hearing her, she's saying, yes, I was dead for years and now I'm coming alive. And I agree. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. Grace. Oh. <laughs> I, we may run over a little bit so we can get this, this one issue down pat. Okay? What I'm trying to show us esoterically using self-talk, to show you the power of self-talk is when the master was crucified, he was put in a tomb. Your skull is symbolic of that tomb. The human skull is symbolic of the tomb that the master was put in. Okay? And when living love, supposedly as we say it, although the way we're saying it is not true, let's put it this way, when the master left the body, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. Now, how many of you were here for the perfect marriage lecture where I said, if you will climb out, living love will come in? When living love comes in, the veil that we hold, let me, let me say it this way. All workshops, including this one, are designed to open the veil from the bottom to the top. All workshops. We start at the red level. And we try to get, you know, have you ever, ever gone to a seven terrace meditation workshop where someone started in the temple? We start at the bottom, okay? And we try to open that veil from the bottom to the top. But I think everybody in here has discovered it slams shut again, doesn't it? We get all excited about ILC and we take the workshop and I'm going to go for it and it's going to work and it starts to work and then all of a sudden the veil slams shut because it has to be rent from top to bottom, okay? So we hold this veil between us, the me I'm afraid I am, the me I want you to believe I am, neither one is me. The real me lives in Solomon's temple behind the veil. The real you is the covenant. Really try and get this. It's serious. I'm not kidding with you. This isn't catchy, fun, esoteric stuff. The real you is the holy of holies. And it's behind the veil. And what we want to do is rend the veil from the top to the bottom, which is, I have to skip. We've already basically gone past this one. You, you see how this is drawn here? Get a good picture of the way this one's drawn. Then there's this one, and we're getting a little closer. If we rend the veil from top to bottom, heaven and earth are one, or we have heaven in earth. Are you with me? Heaven in earth. So all of us at some point, literally consciously, need to go inside of ourselves, take living love off of the cross, wash the body, wrap it in linen, and put it in the tomb. And then wait for the resurrection experience. Because you will discover that if you roll your rock away, we have two holes in our tomb. The master had one because he had already integrated his life. That's why there wasn't two entrances, there's one. We have two, okay? And all of us have boulders in front of our tomb. Now, if you don't think you have a boulder in front of your tomb, I don't know if we'll have time to do it today in the workshop, but I can sit you down across from somebody, and you can start doing eye-staring contact, looking for the Christ, our living love, and you will probably find it's not that easy to roll that boulder away and let somebody look in there. One of the reasons it's not that easy for most of us, 
and I'm including myself, this is not a judgmental lecture, is because I'm not sure that I've resurrected the Christ or not, and I don't want you to find a dead body in there. Yes. Well, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do in this session is show you how much of the master's life was lived in such a way as to show us what self-talk is, this child and this parent. Um, I'm not sure if I can or not. I can tell you that the two angels that Mary Magdalene found were the child and the parent, the other side of the coin. Okay? The child and the parent were the two angels that Mary Magdalene found when she entered the tomb after the rock was rolled away. Yes. <laughs> I hope that's a compliment. <laughs> All right. What I wanted to show us in this session is the two thieves are the child and the parent. They're trying to steal our birthright. We are the Christ, or if you don't like that word, we are living love. Living love has been crucified. That's not an argument, I hope, with any of us. We need to take living love off of the cross, wash the body, wrap it in linen, lay it in the tomb, okay? Roll the rock away and have the resurrection experience. Each one of us will have a day when we will want to be able to say, I am the life and the truth. Are you with me? I hope that hits some of you right here. Yes. Wait, wait, wait for a microphone, please. Well, we want it on tape. I don't want this on tape. <laughs> okay, when you said you were before us and you had to uh, smell good, do this, do that, do that, the first thing that came into my mind was um, a date I was on. I said to myself, gosh, I had an accident and, and my stomach is bigger than it should be, okay, mm -hmm. because I couldn't exercise. And so my, I guess that might be self-talk. Because it said, uh-oh, you're not as attractive because your stomach's a little big. That sounds like self-talk. Okay. <laughs> but I just started expressing things I didn't want to. So I said, I'm embarrassed because my stomach's a little bigger than it used to. And he goes, I love big stomachs. <laughs> <laughs> and I, got, I was shocked. See, he, he liked women barefoot and pregnant. So <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and then another thing about body odors. <laughs> um, we have lost a lot of the uh, body odors that are natural, so um, I just want to say that it is good when you have those natural smells at times. Yes. Huh? <laughs> around some new stinks? <laughs> well, not to the bad sense, but to a good healthy sense. So that's a different opinion. Never mind. Right. I don't understand. That was a metaphor. We hear you. I thought you meant somebody's kind of taking a bath. No, not that. But you know how many go, oh, I didn't, I didn't put my deodorant on. And that was the smell good. Oh, oh that's, that's okay. okay. Not a smelling person. So let me wrap up this session. <laughs> go get some deodorant on. Come back. <laughs> We have the two thieves who are crucified with living love, both trying to steal the birthright. We have living love taken off the cross, put into the tomb, wrapped in linen. The rock is rolled away. At that point, the two thieves, or the child and the parent, become the angels who Mary Magdalene meet. And living love is now a gardener. Are you with me? Taking. So what that tells us is I take the parts of my life that I thought were bad, ugly, wrong, and dirty, I put them into the earth as compost that they may give new life. And the real me, the real you, comes out of the tomb and expresses itself. 
that's all tied into this self-talk workshop is, is the point I wanted to give. You've got your two thieves. You've got your tomb. You've got the rock. I am not trying to get anybody this afternoon to roll the rock away from the tomb. My, my point is, is to get all of us familiar with the fact that there is a tomb, there is a rock, and behind that rock is the real you. And all we have to do to let that part of us out is rent, rent the veil. I used to say rent the veil. <laughs> rent the veil from the top to the bottom and allow that which we really are to come out. And one of the ways to do that is to know what our self-talk is. Because your self-talk makes the veil stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. OK? Let's take a break and come back at about 20 minutes to 5.
Huh? Oh, I am. <laughs> From up here. <laughs> right. Then this stuff is all being filmed and sunk in the whole energy. <laughs> <laughs> the parents. Now, what my hand was pushed towards the camera. I don't know if I can go over some fence. Okay. So what we want to learn to do is get our communications in heaven and out of hell. If you will, we want to take living love inside of self off of the cross. We also want to transform the child in the parent. Get them out of the realm of, if you will, demons who like to argue into angelic beings. So we want to start sending all of our communications as love communications. And I'm also well aware from not having only read and worked with this information, but dealt with it personally, I'm well aware that it is not easy to have someone start to describe the me that I wish I, I, I want you to think I am. And it's not easy to have someone stand in front of you and say, I'm aware of the you that you're afraid you are. And yet, as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, weekends, it's the truth that sets us free. If we try to hide any one of these parts of self, then we have the rock back in front of the tomb. And we want to roll the rock, rock away from the tomb so we can simply be that which we are. Um, now there's a couple, I'll give you, I'm going to give you a 40 day in the wilderness technique. <laughs>